Hello everyone and welcome to today's Dynamics 365 Tech Talk. Today's topic is Dynamics 365 Supply Chain Management, Small Parcel Shipping. My name is David and I'll be your moderator today. We are broadcasting this session through Teams live events and the audio can be heard through your device speakers. This session is being recorded on behalf of the Microsoft Corporation. When you join this event, your name, email address, and or phone number may be viewable by other session participants in the attendee list. By joining, you're agreeing to this experience. The recording will be available on the Tech Talks Community Dynamics page within five business days. If you have questions for the presenters or need support, please use the Q&A panel located on the right side of your screen. Our presenters will be responding to your questions during today's presentation, and there will be time at the end for further questions. Thank you for your patience during these announcements. Presenting for us today from Microsoft, we have Nicole Gump, Senior Program Manager. Nicole, over to you. Thanks, David, and welcome everyone. Uh, with me today, I have my colleague, Zach Greenboss, Principal R&D Solution Architect. Uh, he'll be helping me moderate uh, the chat throughout the presentation, as well as presenting uh, the Q&A at the end. So as David introduced, our topic today is on the small parcel shipping feature in Dynamics 365 Supply Chain Management. Uh, we'll be doing a deep dive um, on this topic as we promised um, in our recent uh, What's New in Supply Chain Management Tech Talk, um, if you were with us for that Tech Talk recently. So let's go over the agenda. We will do an introduction uh, to the functionality and present a use case um, for the feature. Then we'll do a technical overview of, of how to enable this feature. Then we will go through all of the configurations uh, that are required um, to set this up and begin using it. Um, I will then do a demo uh, for you. And then, as we said, we will have time um, for some Q&A at the end. So let's start with an introduction. So we have a B2C, a direct business to consumer example for you here um, for where you might use this small parcel shipping feature. So um, in this use case, we've got a customer who's shopping online um, on your website or on an app. Uh, they place an order um, that's going to be delivered uh, directly to their home address. So your company is going to receive that order that the customer placed um, and then send it to your warehouse to be picked and packed uh, directly to the customer. So because we've got this individual small shipment uh, that's going directly to the customer with just the items that they ordered, um, this is where you may use the new small parcel shipping feature um, to connect directly to any number of um, parcel carriers um, to secure a freight uh, estimate, a tracking number from that carrier, as well as the carrier's shipping label that can be applied directly to the parcel and then be scanned um, when that carrier picks it up uh, from your warehouse facility. So what this looks like um, in more of an infographic uh, view is that we've got our Dynamics 365 uh, supply chain management business application. And specifically, we're going to be talking through um, the warehouse management and transportation management uh, configurations that are required uh, to enable this. Um, and then we've got a, a communication. These are XML uh, messages that are sent and received between Dynamics and the parcel carrier APIs. Um, I have put some examples on here of kind of our major US parcel carriers um, for UPS, FedEx, the Postal Service. Um, you, you know, you might have DHL and some other parcel carriers that you work with, um, but any of them, um, would be communicating back and forth um, with Dynamics 365 um, SCM in those XML um, formatted messages. 
Okay, so what we see um, prior to this feature um, being introduced is that oftentimes, um, if you've got this business scenario where you do need to ship um, small parcels, um, that you'd either have to develop uh, this integration on your own, uh, work with a partner or an ISV who has already developed these integrations as a you know kind of pre-built solution, um, or um, another kind of frequent uh, scenario we saw um, when working with customers is that instead of directly integrating uh, Dynamics 365 with these carriers, that there would be kind of an offline process. Um, so you would pick and pack um, the customer's order in Dynamics and then kind of take that um, package information and manually enter it into, you know, a UPS World Ship FedEx Ship Manager um, and then complete the shipping part of the process in that kind of decoupled um, offline system. So this new small parcel shipping feature um, gives you the ability to integrate that kind of end to end flow and you're going to see that in our demo. So let's go through um, more the technical overview of the actual feature um, in Dynamics. So the feature name when you go to enable this in feature management is small parcel shipping. And as we said, when you enable it, it's allowing you to integrate Dynamics um, with those uh, parcel shipping carriers um, and send them information about the packages or the container level detail um, from Dynamics and then receive in return um, your negotiated rates from that carrier, uh, the tracking number for the parcel and the carrier label. Um, so we do have a caveat here. Um, so even if you enable this feature in Dynamics, um, you're not going to be able to kind of plug and play and start um, communicating uh, with the various carriers. Uh, you do still need to develop um, that rating engine for each specific carrier that you want to work with, either independently um, through your implementation or through a, a partner ISV solution, as we mentioned earlier. Um, what we do have now um, is that Microsoft has made available a demo rating engine um, and you can go out to GitHub, which I'm showing here on the right hand side um, and download this TMS small parcel shipping engine uh, DLL and it will allow you to simulate um, the packing and carrier integration workflow, um, but note that it is not actually communicating with you know a UPS or a FedEx directly. Um, it's more of a dummy engine um, to help you get through the configuration scenario um, and work through the business process and see if this is a fit for you. So if you do want to go this route, and I will say that the demo I'm doing later in the presentation is using um, this demo engine. Um, so if you're in a tier one environment, you can save it locally um, via RDP into your environment. Um, or if you're in a tier two plus, uh, you need to save this and then deploy it through um, your typical LCS um, application lifecycle management process. And um, I did put a link in here and you will get the uh, slide deck after the recording is posted. Um, this is our docs article on the feature um, and it is rather detailed. Um, it's got a good step-by-step uh, -step, um, kind of hands-on lab that will walk you through a very similar process um, that I'm going to show here in the slides um, and in the demo. So if you want to follow along or reference this afterwards, uh, this is a good um, Docs article out there. So let's go through um, each of the configurations uh, that are required in Dynamics. Um, so just from an overview of all the configurations that we're going to go through, we've got a set of both transportation and warehouse setups that we need to do. Uh, some of them are required, and those are our rating engine, which we mentioned um, that's what you need the DLL for. Um, the setup of the shipping carrier in TMS, 
the container packing policy and the packing profile are related settings and they are in WMS. Then the carrier service account and carrier customer account are related. Um, one of these is in TMS and one of them is actually set up on the customer record so you can get there um, from accounts receivable. Um, we've got some optional setups as well um, that I'm going to walk through in the event that you do not already have a packing workflow configured in your warehouse management processes. So um, optionally, we would also need to set up uh, directive codes, work templates and location directives, and then default some settings on your worker record. Um, and these are all WMS settings. So you can see we've got a good mix um, of both uh, to really get this um, workflow enabled. So let's go through each of these. And um, I will say before we start um, with the detail here that I have some screenshots um, that you will see for each of these uh, configurations here on the slideware, um, but I do not plan to go over all of the configuration forms in the environment during the demo. We're gonna actually just walk through the business process. So if you have additional questions that I'm not answering um, on the configuration side, uh, please put them in the chat. Um, Zach can surface those at the end. Okay, so we're gonna start with the rating engine. This is really the, the most crucial piece here to being able to utilize this feature. Um, so it is in transportation management. Um, and you can see the form um, here on the right hand side in the screenshot. So what you're going to do is create a new engine for the small parcel shipping. Uh, you can name it whatever you'd like. Um, that is not really the important part. Uh, the important part is the engine assembly and the engine class um, in this setup. So you can see them here, these um, lengthy uh, configuration names. Um, in the form. So the engine assembly is going to be that DLL um, file that you either downloaded from GitHub from our demo um, or is a custom DLL that you develop for your implementation or is one that an ISV has provided to you um, if you're uh, purchasing like a pre-built solution. So that will go in the engine assembly field um, and then the engine class. Um, it's going to be this lengthy um, class name and then dot uh, the name of the engine assembly. So for ours, um, it's that small parcel shipping rate engine um, and that may be a different name um, depending on what DLL you're using. But um, populating these two fields, the engine assembly and the engine class um, are what is going to be important for this rate engine setup for small parcel shipping. I have made a note that um, you may see that the rating metadata ID is blank um, in my screenshot. Uh, that's not a missed configuration. That's actually correct um, because it's not required uh, when we're working with these parcel carrier um, integrations. So unlike um, setting up rate engines for like a point to point rating engine that we discussed in our uh, TMS rating uh, tech talk, um, where you do need the rating metadata to know, you know, what fields are mandatory to look up from the rating information that is actually housed within the transportation management module. Here we are retrieving rates that are housed in the parcel carrier system and we're just, um, you know, pinging their API and asking for that information. So because we are not, um, configuring those rates in TMS, we don't need the rating metadata here. So moving on to our next required uh, configuration, which is the shipping carrier. So still in TMS. Here you can see the screenshot of my uh, shipping carrier on the right. Um, I set up one for UPS. So you're going to create a new carrier record. Um, that's, of course, if you don't already have these carriers um, configured in your environment. Um, 
one of the important things you want to do at the top in the overview tab of the shipping carrier setup is to activate the carrier rating. Um, if you do not do that, then the transportation management um, module will not um, essentially look uh, for this carrier during the rating scenarios. So you want to make sure you activate it. And then um, in the next tab for the service levels, you want to make sure that for each level of service that you intend to ship with this parcel carrier, um, and you can see I've got the examples for UPS as ground, and next day air, and saver. Those are actually service levels um, defined by UPS. That what we want to do is populate this external code field um, for the service, and it's actually cut off in the screenshot, but it's right next to this mode of delivery field. Um, and the, these external codes are actually standardized by each parcel carrier, right? So UPS ground is something like 03, right? And that's their code for them to know uh, which service level you intend to ship when you are sending um, the XML uh, detail to them. And they are different by carrier. Um, so those are standardized, though you can find them, um, you know, populated um, on the parcel carriers um, websites. You should be able to retrieve that information fairly easily. And then um, at the bottom in the rating profiles tab um, of your shipping carrier setup, we want to make sure to create a new rating profile here and specify the rate engine that we created in the previous step. So you know, altogether, this um, shipping carrier setup is saying, you know, when we're rating, um, we want to go ahead and use that engine uh, with the engine assembly and the engine class we specified uh, previously. So uh, let's move on and talk about a couple of the required settings we have on the warehouse management side. Um, and you may be wondering, you know, we're talking about integrating with parcel carriers. Why are we going through warehouse management setups? Um, and the answer is because the trigger um, for the system to send that XML message to your parcel carrier is in the container close function, um, which is part of our manual packing process in WMS. So that is not a transportation management function, even though the actual action of the rating um, is a transportation management function. So and hopefully that will make um, a little bit more sense uh, as we go through the demo as well. But let's talk through um, the couple of warehouse management uh, packing related configurations that are required. So the first one is the container packing policy. Um, and a few things we want to configure here is first you're just going to create the new policy and then a couple of settings that we want to make sure we have are the automate manifest at container close that's here in the container manifest tab um, and that tells the system again as you close the container that that's the trigger um, to do the rating and it goes hand in hand with this next bullet of um, setting the manifest requirements for the container to transportation management. So that is telling the system, you know, go look at the transportation management um, rating setups that we just configured previously to go ahead and find a rate for this container that I'm closing. And then the other important thing on this setup um, specific to the small parcel shipping feature is that we have this new uh, tab when this feature is enabled for carrier label printing. Um, and you can see that in the screenshot, I have mine set to never, and it's only because I don't have a um, like a ZPL uh, label printer hooked up um, for my demo environment. So I don't want to generate these labels, um, but you can set this uh, to always print the a carrier shipping label and then specify which printer um, it's going to print to so that when you get that XML response from the parcel carrier, it's going to contain the full ZPL for the shipping carriers label uh, that needs to be applied to the outside of the box for them to be able to scan into their network. Um, so you would uh, just specify the printer that's 
typically right there on a packing workstation. So um, the packing um, policy that we just talked about is related uh, directly to this packing profile setup. So uh, you can see here in the screenshot um, that it's actually specified when you create a new packing profile. So as you create your new profile, um, as I said, you're going to select that container packing policy that you just created. And then the other settings um, in this packing profile are really just um, some defaults that can be specified when you're in that manual packing process in WMS. So there's a pack form. Um, when you're creating new containers in that form, uh, the container ID mode tells the system whether or not you want to automatically populate a container ID number just based on a number sequence, um, or if you want to manually populate that container ID. Sometimes people do this because they've got maybe a pre-printed role of labels um, that they want to scan as the container ID, or they just want to manually um, enter the value. That's fine. You can um, set this so that it's defaulted appropriately for your business process. And then the other default you have um, that's relevant here is the container type. And this is kind of your, think of it as your most commonly used um, kind of size of container that you're packing into. So even if you have, you know, a dozen different container types configured to use, um, you know, there may be one that you're using, you know, 60% of the time even, and you may want that to be your default because then that's just one less selection um, that the user in the packing form has to make. So it makes their uh, process a little bit more efficient by setting those defaults. Okay, so moving to um, the carrier service account. So we're back in transportation management um, and this carrier service account um, you're going to create a new record in this form and what you're going to do is enter the carrier's um, account number that you have with them. So for my example, I'm using UPS. This would be my actual account number that I have as a customer directly with UPS. So if I go to UPS's website and I log in, this is my account number. Um, and the carrier provides you this account number as you, you know, set up an account with them. And um, the reason it's important to populate it here is because this is authenticating um, the connection between Dynamics and that carrier's API. So it's getting passed through that XML message um, to say, you know, this is my account um, and to look up your specific rates that you may have negotiated with that parcel carrier um, for what you're trying to ship. And the other note I have here is you will see some additional fields in this configuration form, like the carrier service level or a specific site and warehouse. Um, but I will caution that if you fill these in, um, then only that specific um, combination of settings will apply. So if you happen to set like UPS ground in your account number um, and then you are packing um, something that is a next day error um, shipment, then this record is not going to apply because you made it specific to the ground service level. So then you would have an error, right? Because it can't find an account uh, to send for that next day error shipment or you would end up having to create additional records here, right, for each specific like carrier and service level combination, which is probably an unnecessary amount of configuration because likely that account number, especially when we're talking about parcel carriers, is not going to change based on the service level. Okay, you've got the same account number. Um, so our recommendation is just to set this up at the highest level right without specifying um, additional detail it, and, unless you have a, a use case or a, a business requirement for it. OK, and as I mentioned, that carrier account number is important because it's authenticating that connection right between our, our business application and the carrier API. So um, that's really the key uh, field here in this setup. 
And then um, I believe this is our last required uh, configuration we're going to go through, and it is the carrier customer account, uh, confusingly named very similar to what we just talked about. Um, but this setting, as I mentioned, is actually in the customer record, so you can get there from accounts receivable um, through your all customer setup. And with this feature enabled, there's this new form under the general setup tab on the customer called carrier customer accounts. And you can create a new record in this form. Um, it will fill in the customer account based on whatever account you accessed it from. Um, and then you will fill in the parcel shipping carrier. And this would typically be used if there's like a preference that that customer has for shipping their parcels. And what you can do is instead of using your account number that you just configured in the last um, setup to rate the parcels, you can actually essentially override that with the customer's account number. And then when you um, rate with this um, setup, it's going to pass this carrier customer account number which should be different from yours, um, and it will retrieve their rates uh, for the parcels. So um, if a customer has this requirement, you know, if you've got some large, uh, maybe, you know, big box retail customers, your Bed Bath & Beyond or Target, um, that they may have uh, this requirement of you. And so you can set this up on the um, customer account. So that's all of our required configurations, um, but I'm going to talk through a few of the optional ones in case you do not already have a packing workflow configured in WMS. So if you do not, the first thing um, you'll want to do is add a new directive code for packing. So you're going to go into warehouse management um, and in the setup of the directive codes, uh, you're just going to specify, you know, whatever you'd like to name it. I just called it pack um, here for me. This, these are user defined uh, codes. And uh, what you're going to do um, is ultimately use this code that you've defined in your work template and location directive that we're going to talk about next. Um, so that's why we want to set it up first. So let's talk about where it's used. Um, the first place it's used is in our work template. So again, optional setup. Um, what we recommend is um, you'll probably want to set up a new work template just specific to this small parcel shipping uh, workflow. Even if you've already got, you know, another sales order picking uh, work template defined. And what we're going to do is use that directive code we created previously and um, define it on the put step of our work template. So we've got our pick and our put, and we're using the directive code on the put to say, um, you know, any work that's created with this template is being directed to the packing station. Okay, and we recommend that um, in the edit query on this work template that you would specify um, the small parcel shipping carriers. Um, so in my case, it's, you know, the UPS carrier that I configured. Um, that way, this work template is limited to just those scenarios when you're, you know, shipping UPS. And that way, when the system is scanning through trying to find, you know, the appropriate work template during the wave process, uh, that it knows, okay, I've got a UPS shipment. Uh, this is the work template that is going to apply. And then it creates the work to direct the, the put to the packing station. So uh, that will just help um, actually, you know, with some of the processing time in the wave. And then directly related to that setup is our location directive then. Um, and I'm showing in the screenshot the put directive. Um, your pick directive may be the same as it is for your other workflows. Um, you know, if you were previously had a business process where you were picking and then just you know, maybe staging or putting directly to your bay door or your final shipping location, uh, the pick may be the same, um, but the put is where we have a difference and we want to use that directive code. So again, this is optional, but we would want to create a new put um, for the small parcel shipping scenario 
And again, we're going to use that directive code that we created and we're going to put it up here in the header. Um, so under this location directives tab, you put the directive code for pack. And this is your kind of direct link between that work template we just set up and this specific put location directive. So again, um, this link is really just helping the system as it's going through the wave process to cut down on some of that time that it's scanning through all the directives. And it can just say, OK, I already evaluated the work template that fits. You've told me the directive code is pack. I find a location directive with the same code. Um, so now I don't have to scan through, you know, X number of other location directives that you might have configured. So um, this is really a, a performance gain. And then what you want to do um, at the bottom to kind of follow this through is uh, go to the location directive actions tab and say that you're going to um, put this to the packing station. So this is in the edit query here is where you're actually going to specify that packing location, or maybe you've got you know a location profile for packing, um, or maybe you've got a whole zone uh, defined in the warehouse um, of packing lanes. It, it really depends on how you've configured um, your locations within your warehouse, um, but at whatever level makes sense, um, you're going to specify that criteria in the edit query here um, to say you know this is the actual location. Um, or location type that it needs to go to for packing. So the final um, optional configuration I want to go through is the worker setup. So this is the worker record um, from warehouse management setup. And there's a few things uh, we want to point out here. One is that you can specify the default uh, packing profile at the top and it is linked again to that container packing policy, if you remember uh, from the previous configurations that we talked about. Um, and if you specify these, um, it's going to default it when you open the pack form in WMS. And that way this worker doesn't have to select those each time they open the pack form. So it's just less clicks um, for the user. And um, you can also select um, in the default packing station tab the site warehouse and even specific location of the packing station that this particular worker is working in. So if they have an assigned um, packing station, you can default it here. Again, um, the whole point is just to kind of speed up the login to that packing form. Um, otherwise, again, all of these uh, settings have to be chosen every time you open the form. So a little bit cumbersome. This can speed that up um, a little bit. And one more note here that is important because what you may do um, is set these up, open your pack form, and then you know, realize that none of them are populated. And you're going to say to yourself, why is that happening? Um, it's happening because this actual worker record uh, that this is tied to. So in my case, it's this Contoso demo user of Julia Funderburk. Um, she must be the person associated to my system user that I'm logged in with um, in order for these settings to be applied to that pack form. So if I do not associate her as the person to my user, then I'm going to open that pack form. These are going to be blank and I'm going to see that the worker record is like grayed out and it's blank as well on the pack form. So that's kind of your indication that you need to go check this setup on your system user. And we'll see that when we open the pack form in the demo. So um, let me open up um, the system and we'll go through the demo. So let's refresh here. And as I said, um, all of those configurations that we just walked through, I don't intend um, for the sake of time to walk through them again here. Um, so we're actually just going to walk through the business process. But if you do have questions um, right after the demo, um, I'm going to have um, some time for, for Zach to present any questions. So um, go ahead and put them in the chat. So we're going to start with um, in accounts receivable. I'm just going to go and create a new sales order. So I'm just going to pick um, a retail location here. 
So let's say we've got a, a retail order. Um, a customer has ordered something from us. Um, the first thing I'm going to do when I've got this sales order is actually switch to the header view so that I can define um, how I'm going to shift this. Um, and one other thing I'm going to point out while I'm here, because uh, it's going to be important later on, and the question may come up, is that our delivery terms, and you can see that these are defaulted for my customer, but in the transportation charges, um, so our freight estimate that we're going to get from the parcel carrier, if we're in this retail scenario, um, you know, oftentimes from, uh, you know, the retail point of sale, you know, shipping may be charged up front or a flat fee, and we don't want to pass through the actual shipping charge, the one that we're going to get from the parcel carrier to the customer on this sales order so that it's not invoiced. Um, so if that's ends up being an internal charge uh, that we're consuming, then we want to make sure that these terms of delivery are set to not add the transportation charges to our retail orders. OK. Um, and that's what you'll see in the demo as we go through. But I wanted to point it out um, because that's where it's controlled, um, if you will. So I'm going to use um, that UPS shipping carrier that I configured uh, that we talked about in the slides. And I'm going to go ahead and pick a service level as well. I'm just going to say we're going to ship it ground. So this is not um, an expedited service. And you'll see that when I do that, it actually updated that mode of delivery to the one that's um, related to my shipping uh, carrier and service level combination. So I'm going to save that. Um, I'm going to go back to the lines of the sales order and actually add uh, the item that our customer ordered. Um, in this case, we've got some HDMI cables. Um, we've got a pack of them. Um, I'm going to leave that. I've got a manual reservation policy um, in this demo environment. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and do the reservation. Um, I can see I'm working in my WMS enabled warehouse with the Contoso data. So warehouse 24. Um, I've got plenty of on hand inventory for this item. So I'm just going to go ahead and reserve the whole lot, which you can see is kind of six uh, eaches for that one pack that was on my sale order line. So now that I've got a reservation, I can release this to the warehouse. I'm going to do it directly from the sales order um, because this is a transportation management tech talk. Uh, but you can see that we've got work that's created here um, and I'm going to actually access this directly from the sales order line as well. So from the warehouse uh, drop down, we've got work details. And you can see here that based on that work template I configured um, and the location directive that I have work that's been created for a pick from my floor location where my inventory is stored and then it's um, telling me to put that to my packing station. So I'm going to go ahead and process this work on my app. So let me log in. I'm going to go to my outbound menu and go to my sales picking process. You're getting a preview here of a new feature that's coming up um, for wave two. So be on the lookout for our uh, what's new um, in SCM wave two 2021 coming up here soon. Um, but I'm going to go ahead and process this work. Um, it, it's asking me for the pick. Um, which license plate I'm picking off of because I've got license plate controlled um, storage locations. And then I'm not taking the entire license plate, so I need to give it a target. Um, so let me go ahead and scan a target license plate ID. And then it's telling me as a final step um, to go ahead and deliver this to the put location, which is that pack location. Oh, OK, so that was a quick walkthrough of the pick. But again, this is a transportation management tech talk. So let's go ahead and look. Um, you can see that my work is closed. Um, my target license plate, I'm going to copy because I'm going to need this for my packing form. Um, so I'm going to close this. I will actually close our sales order. And now we're going to get into that warehouse management packing workflow. So under warehouse management, uh, packing and containerization is where we access the pack form. 
So here is where you'll see um, that worker record. And again, that's because this is the person that is connected to my system user and therefore um, it can go to that worker uh, setup and pull in all my defaults. So if I did not have this set up, I would have to go in and fill all these in every time I access this form. So again, just takes a little extra time. Um, it's nice to have those defaults um, in there. So I can just say, OK, yes, I'm working in that warehouse at that tax station. And then what I can do is just scan that target ID that I have, um, the license plate for my picking work. And if I tab out of that field, um, you'll see it's going to populate all the related information for me. So I can see from this form at a glance, you know, my shipment ID, um, if there's any containers that have already been packed for this shipment, um, you know, my defaults from my packing station that I'm in. I'm just going to collapse those so we can see more of the packing um, information. But you'll see that it also pulled in the customer information. So, um, and my shipping information, which is important for this um, SPS demo that we're doing. Okay, so if you're not familiar with this pack form or the packing workflow, I'm going to scroll down and show you a few more things. Um, one of them is the open containers tab. Um, that is where you'll create a new container and then um, start packing into it and it will show you, you know, kind of incrementally uh, the quantity of items in the container um, and the gross weight um, as you're adding items. And you'll put items in that container by using this item packing tab. And down at the bottom, uh, you can see that just by uh, me scanning this target LP that the open line section is going to show me exactly which item and the quantity of that item are at the pack station. So this is the put step from the work that we did um, and it's showing me the quantity in the inventory unit, not the pack um, and what has already been packed into a container. So I haven't packed anything yet, so I've got, you know, all six pieces remaining to pack. Um, and then the all line section is just showing you um, what is been packed. Um, so you'll see that as we pack everything, eventually the open lines uh, section is going to be blank and everything is going to move down to this all lines section and it will show a quantity that matches the packed quantity. But we can, um, I'll point that out again as we go through. So that's um, kind of the structure of this packing form. Um, so let me create a new container and I'm going to stop and point out here again that these defaults, uh, the container ID that it gave me and the default container type are coming from uh, that packing profile setup that we did earlier. So um, I'm just having it default to container ID, you know, based on the number sequence. That's fine for me. Uh, this small box is kind of my default type. Um, if I don't think that this particular shipment, these six, HDMI cables are going to fit in a small box. I can change the default uh, to maybe a medium box. Not a big deal. So I'm going to say, OK, that's the container that I'm packing into. And you can see, um, as I mentioned earlier, in the open containers tab, we now have some information populated to say this is the container I'm actively packing. Um, you can see I have not packed anything there yet. There is no quantity. But there is a gross weight and this gross weight is coming from the tear weight of the container type. So this empty box essentially weighs this much um, without us packing anything into it. Um, and that's important. The weight is one of the key um, pieces of information that we send to the parcel carrier to get an accurate freight charge. So um, it's important that those tear weights of your boxes and the weights of your items are accurate in your master data. OK, um, so I'm going to scroll down here and I'm going to start packing items into my container by using this item packing tab. Um, and what you'll notice is that it's defaulting this quantity of one. And if I pick in the identifier field, this is my item number. Um, if I pick that item, what it's going to do, it's very quick, it looked like nothing happened, but it put one item into my box. And you can see that it added, and my gross weight is now eight, right? So my tear weight was five, so my one of these items must weigh three. 
Um, and what it did down here in the open lines was show me that out of the six that I put here to the pack station, I have packed one. So I have five remaining pieces to pack. Um, obviously, that's tedious. Um, and the more efficient way to do this is to pick the full quantity that you're packing into this container. Um, so I'm going to pick the remaining five all at once of this item. And you can see that that was much more efficient. I now have all six in the box um, for a total gross weight of 23. Um, as I mentioned earlier, the open lines are empty because the remaining quantity is zero. And now I can still see everything, though, that's in this container by looking at the all lines uh, tab. And I can see that everything has been packed, right? My packing quantity um, is equal to my total quantity and remaining is zero. So um, what I've got now is basically a container that's at my packing station. It's been packed and now I'm ready to close the container, which if you remember from earlier in the presentation is our trigger um, to make that call out to the parcel carrier API and get our rate and our tracking number in our label. Um, but let me show you first um, in case you just wanna look maybe at this container record before you close it. You can go to this containers at station dropdown from the pack form and look at all the open containers that are sitting at the packing station. So that gives you um, the container record view of what's been packed. And you can see, um, you know, currently we're still in process of this because I haven't closed it. Um, I do not have a freight charge, which is in this total freight charge field or a tracking number yet, um, because again, we haven't done that trigger of closing the container. But the tracking number shows up in this not so logical container manifest ID field. OK, so this is where we'll see the tracking ID and then we'll have the freight charge. So I can close the container actually from this form. Um, I'm going to go back and do it from the pack form because likely that's going to be the process. You know, so you pack um, your quantity, your item into the container you created, and then you're just going to go ahead and say close container from here. Uh, this is the same form that would pop up if you click the button on the container record. Um, it's just another way to do it. Um, so you can see that it's telling me my location that it's going to is now the bay door. So we kind of skipped this setup, but in the um, warehouse management container packing policy setup where we talked about doing the manifest at container close and using the transportation management for the rating and where we specified our printer for our shipping label. Um, there are also configurations in that form that allow you to say when you close a container, do you want to go ahead and just, you know, essentially say that you are done um, with that uh, container and you're just ready to send it out the door? Um, or do you have an additional um, kind of movement process that needs to happen? And do you need to create additional work uh, to move that package from the packing station, maybe to a staging location? Maybe you're building up a full pallet of all your UPS parcels um, and, you, you know, your UPS delivery driver comes in once a day at 4 p.m. and scans the whole pallet. Um, then maybe you've got a workflow um, after packing and you don't want to just send this directly to the bay door. In my case, we're going directly to the bay door. This is just going out the door. Um, so you can fill in uh, the gross weight manually. You can do a scale integration here as well if you've got like a scale that you're actually weighing it. Um, or you can use this get system weight and it should equal this gross weight that you were seeing um, on the pack form. Again, that's just taking the total um, items times the items weight plus the tear weight of the box that it's in. OK, but again, this is really important um, because it's what we're going to send to the carrier along with the dimensions typically um, are what the carrier needs to give you an accurate freight charge. So I'm going to go ahead and say OK to close this container. It's going to look like absolutely nothing happened. But this is the whole point um, of the trigger for SPS. OK, so what really did happen um, was that we sent an XML message um, to our carrier and they sent us back information um, about our container and we can now go see that. Um, you may think that you can go back to this, the containers at station and look at the closed containers from here. 
but what you'll notice is that this is blank and it's because um, if you remember from when I just closed that container, I sent it to my bay door. So it's not actually at my pack station anymore, which is why we're not seeing it in this particular view. But you can um, go ahead and close the pack form and see the container um, back in the packing and containerization uh, from warehouse management and in the containers uh, form. So you'll see it here, this last record that I just packed this medium box, uh, 23 was my gross weight. And if I scroll over, what you're gonna see is I have a tracking number now in that container manifest ID field uh, that comes from that RAID engine, that DLL um, that I am using for the demo engine. You can tell it's a demo engine and not really UPS because it doesn't have the 1Z prefix if you're familiar with all the shipping carriers. Um, but it will have your tracking number and then it'll have your freight charge. So uh, this is $69 to send this medium box uh, to my customer UPS ground. OK, um, and if you remember from earlier as well, I did say that my container packing policy is set up to not print the carrier shipping label. That's because I don't have an actual hardware printer device uh, set up to my demo environment, um, but it would uh, generate that. Um, send it to your printer and you can always do a reprint from this container record as well, right? Uh, so you can come in and, and reprint the shipping label if for whatever reason your printer jammed or ran out of ink or label stock, uh, you can come back in um, and print this. Okay, so that is really um, the essence of the small parcel shipping uh, feature being enabled um, without it. Uh, when you close containers, you do not get that communication and you do not get this information populated. Um, kind of to wrap the demo, I'm going to show you the actual transaction message that's sent back and forth uh, just to kind of prove to you here that something did happen in our rating side. So if we go to transportation management and under our periodic tasks, we've got this transactions form. Um, it's actually there for all of your um, PMS uh, kind of native rating um, as well. So if you're doing like LTL or TL rating, um, those pass through this transactions record as well. So this is just a good form to be aware of. Um, but for the small parcel shipping scenario, you'll see my transaction down here for small parcel trans. And these are the actual XML um, requests and responses um, that are sent. Uh, to that carrier API here again that demo engine if you go get it from github is just kind of a dummy it's not actually tied to like a UPS or a FedEx or anything like that um, but we are getting a response back um, from that engine with the the rate the label um, you'll see down here um, as I'm hovering over it that there's a ZPL shipping label format uh, with all the information that would go to your printer and the rate and the tracking number OK, so and if you're troubleshooting, like if there's an error that comes back from the carrier that says, you know, the delivery address is invalid or the weights too much for the service level, whatever it might be, um, you would see that error code um, not only in the response data, but it should be surfaced in the packing form as you're closing the container. Uh, that was part of the SPS feature that we released as well. All right, so I know we're running up. Um, close to the end of our time. So I want to uh, kind of end the demo there and I'm going to go back um, and turn it over to Zach for any Q&A. Hey Nicole, uh, thanks. So a couple things. Um, when you were showing that box, um, there was a question around what is the unit of weight um, that that box is using in terms of that tear weight? And then maybe a follow on, what is, what if, how do you define the item sort of unit of weight and what if those are different? Where, where is that defined? Sure, um, good question. Um, because sometimes you'll find um, as you're working with the parcel carriers that they want the weight in a specific unit of measure. So um, that is important to know. So let me go through a few things. Um, one of which is the item itself, right? So if we, I'm gonna open a release product. And of course, this is the, the one thing that wants to be slow, huh? Um, but we'll look at the um, item that I shipped here, which is just this HDMI 
cable in our Contoso data. Um, and if we scroll down um, under manage inventory, we've got uh, the weight. So we've got the net weight um, and a tear weight of the actual item. Maybe it's packaged in, you know, like a, a plastic cellophane packaging or something. Um, and then it calculates the gross weight. Um, the unit of measure for the weight is actually the system unit of measure for weight. So it depends on how you have your units defined. Um, and then I'm going to show you as well the um, containers. So the setup um, in WMS under containers and container types. So I used this medium box and here's the tear weight. Again, if I don't specify a unit um, here in the actual um, container type, it's going to use the system weight. Um, same thing for you know, length, width, or volumetric um, dimensions. Um, it's going to use, you know, the system unit uh, value. And then um, one other thing I want to point out, um, so we've got the item and the actual box type there, and then I want to point out on the container record itself. So if I open this form back up, um, I already closed um, this container. I could reopen it. Let's see what happens. Um, and then go ahead and let's see if we can reclose it. You can see on here that you do actually have the opportunity to change the weight unit on the closed container. So if my system unit is pounds, but I'm shipping UPS and they want everything in kilograms, um, I can change it. OK, and I close my container and it's going to give me a new tracking number and it charged me way more because now I'm shipping 23 kilos and not 23 pounds, I guess. Um, but this is what was just returned. So that was 69 before. So you can see I've got a different value that came back when I reopened that and then closed it again. Hopefully that helps. Um, was there another question? Uh, we're reaching the end of our time. I think um, I think we're good. We've, we've handled most of the questions in the chat, so I think we're all right. OK, great. Um, so let me switch back to the slides. Um, if you do have you know, specific questions, um, if you're setting this up and, and testing it yourself and want to give us some feedback, um, please feel free to reach out. And otherwise, um, thank you for attending uh, the Tech Talk today, and I'm going to kick it back to David to close us out. Thank you, Nicole. I've posted a link to a short survey in the Q&A panel. We'd like your feedback on today's session and hear what you'd like to see in future events. Thank you for your participation. As a reminder, the recording of today's session will be available on the Tech Talks Community Dynamics page within five business days. I'd like to extend a big thank you to our presenters and audience for joining us today.